Amen. You may be seated. There is joy in the Lord. Amen. 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 So let's take our Bibles. We're going to turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 1, the fifth book of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy. So this is the instructions that Moses is giving to the next generation that are going to go in and inherit the promised land. The first five books that we have in our Bible were written by Moses. They're referred to as the law or the Hebrew word for law, Torah, or the Pentateuch, the Greek meaning five books. And as we just recap where we've been, Genesis gives us four major events and four major personalities. The four major events, of course, number one is the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then number two is the fall of man, where man sinned and death entered into the world. And then also the flood of Noah's day and the table of nations, the dispersing of the nations throughout the earth. Those first 11 chapters cover 2,000 years of time. And then God zeroes in on a people group that he's going to bring the Savior into the world through. And that would be Abraham, called from Ur of the Chaldees, present-day Babylon, into the Promised Land, or the land of Canaan, or present-day Israel, and promises him that land and his descendants. And that promise was reiterated to his son Isaac and then to his son Jacob. And as we follow the story of Abraham and his descendants, we find that Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, was sold into slavery down into Egypt. And that's what gets the children of Israel from the promised land down into Egypt because of a famine that's taken place in the land. And that takes us to the book of Exodus, where as the children of Israel continued to grow, the Pharaoh became concerned at the size of the people, so he made them slaves. And so they were slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years, and they cried out to God, and God sent them a deliverer named Moses. And Moses came, and through a series of 10 plagues, they came out of Egypt through the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, and they came to Mount Sinai, where they entered into covenant with God, the first covenant. We refer to it as the Old Covenant, uh, recorded in our Old Testament. And that's where we receive the law, part of that being the Ten Commandments, and also the instructions of the tabernacle, this portable worship sanctuary, the place they would come to to approach God. That brings us to the next book, the book of Leviticus, and this is how they were to approach God, and that would be through the sacrificial system, animal sacrifices. And, and the reason for that is the idea of dealing with the issue of sin. There's got to be a blood atonement that takes place because the soul that sins deserves death. And so instead of the person dying, there can be innocent blood that's shed, the blood of an animal. So God introduces early on the idea of a substitute, someone, something in this case that can come and pay for the sins of the people, die in place of the people. And of course, that's a picture of Jesus, isn't it? That Jesus came, the whole reason he died on the cross was to be able to get our sins forgiven. He died in our place so that when we trust him as our savior, our sins are forgiven. So the book of Leviticus introduces us to the sacrificial system in the law, then various laws that we have there, and of course the feast days that we have as well. And that takes us to the book of Numbers where they head to the promised land. And it would take, as we're gonna find out this morning, uh, just under two weeks to get to the promised land, but it's gonna take them 40 years to get in there. And that's because of unbelief. Because when they got to the border, they saw that there were giants in the land and they were afraid. They didn't think God was gonna fight their battles for them. So they ended up marching in the wilderness and that generation dying off. The book of Numbers is called Numbers because of the census that takes place in the book of Numbers. Numbering the, the uh, fighting males from 20 years old and above, that generation that came out of Egypt, and also numbering, again, those fighting males of the next generation, those that would go into the Promised Land. Both numberings, just over 600,000 fighting men, 20 years old and above. So that gives you maybe two to three million people that have come out of Egypt and that are going to head into the promised land. And that brings us to the book of Deuteronomy. Now, the book of Deuteronomy, again, as I mentioned, is the law that Moses is speaking to this next generation because those who came out of Egypt, those that were at Mount Sinai that originally received the law, those that were 20 years old and above, they've all perished now during this 40 year period in the wilderness. So this is everybody 
20 or 19 and under and then those who have been born. So it, it's a communication of this law. The word Deuteronomy is taken from the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Septuagint, and what it means is second law. But this isn't a, a second law in addition to the first law. It's a repeat of the first law given to this next generation. And so Moses is communicating these instructions to them. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says the Hebrew title is a more apt description of the book, for it is not a second law, but the record of Moses' sermons on the law. The Hebrew title is not Deuteronomy. The Hebrew title, like many books in the Old Testament, is taken from the first few words of the first verse of the book. And so if you look at Deuteronomy 1.1, it says these are the words. And that's the title of the book, The Words, or These Are the Words. And what we have recorded here in this book are the words of Moses explaining the law to this next generation. So a quick outline of the book, we see four sermons of Moses. The first four chapters, Moses is going to give a recount of them leaving Mount Sinai, going to the border of the Promised Land, not going in because of unbelief, and then after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, coming up the eastern side of the Dead Sea and the Jordan River and poised, ready to go in across from Jericho into the Promised Land. That's the first four chapters that we have in Deuteronomy. And then beginning in chapter 5, the bulk of the book, again, we have him bringing this law that God gave them at Mount Sinai to this next generation, speaking on moral, social, and religious issues. And so Moses goes over the law, and he expands on it as well. And then the third sermon that's given, it's pretty much a warning. You're going to be blessed if you obey, but you're going to be cursed if you disobey. So that's chapters um, 29 and, or 27 and 28 for Moses' third sermon. And then the fourth sermon, Moses reminds Israel of God's covenant and he urges them to choose life. And then that mantle is passed on to the next leader, who would be Joshua, and Moses will die not being able himself to go into the promised land. So therein is the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is quoted some 80 times in the New Testament. So as we read through the book, we're going to be going, wow, I, I recognize that verse. I recognize that passage because it's quoted so often from the New Testament. In fact, Jesus quoted the book of Deuteronomy exclusively when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. If you want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8, we'll see those passages. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he had fasted for 40 days. It says that he had become hungry. And the devil came to him and said, if you're the son of God, command these stones that they become bread. And you remember what Jesus said to Satan, that man does not live by bread alone. Remember, that's Deuteronomy 8.3. And this is where God is, is speaking, or Moses speaking to what God did to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 8.3, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, there's more to life than food. There's trusting in everything that God has for you in every direction that he gives you in your life. Well, back to the temptations of Satan to Jesus. Satan took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple and said, throw yourself down from here if you're the son of God. And Jesus responded with Deuteronomy 6, 16, if you back up a page, where he said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Don't put God to the test. Don't, don't trust that his angels are going to bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You're not going to do that to the Lord. And then finally, Satan took Jesus and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said, all of these were delivered over to me and I can give them to whoever I wish. And if you will bow down and worship me, I will give them to you. And you remember what Jesus said to Satan, get behind me, Satan, for you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And that is Deuteronomy 6, 13. Notice how that reads. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 6.13, from which he is quoting, you shall fear the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? It means to respect him. It means to reverence him. It means to stand in awe of him. It means to 
to worship him. It's kind of neat how that ties that together, isn't it? And so here in the book of Deuteronomy, again, it's quoted a number of times in the New Testament. The purpose of the book of Deuteronomy, again, it's to instill in the hearts of this younger generation God's word as they're ready to go into the promised land. Let me read a, a, a couple of sentences from the Bible Knowledge Commentary concerning the purpose of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses was preaching the law to Israel to impress God's word on their hearts. His goal was to get the people to renew the covenant made at Sinai, to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. Only by unreservedly committing themselves to the Lord could the people hope to enter the promised land, conquer its inhabitants, and then live in prosperity and peace. So what we have here, if you will, from Moses' final words to the children of Israel. Let's jump right in, Deuteronomy 1.1. 1, 1. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them. It's 11 days from Horeb. Horeb's another name from, from Mount Sinai. It's 11 days journey from there to Kadesh Barnea, which was the border of the promised land, and now we're 40 years later. And the reason for that, again, is because the, the people were scared to go into the land. So if you look at a map of it, they came out of Egypt and came to Mount Sinai, represented by the number two, and it's there that they received the law of God and how to worship God and how to live before a holy God. And then after a year at Mount Sinai, they went to the border of the promised land, represented by the number three, which is the spies going into the land. And there as they're at the border at Kadesh Barnea, the spies come back, as we'll be seeing, and they brought a negative report and so influenced the children of Israel that, that they said, would it be better off if we simply died here in the wilderness? And so God answered that, that prayer, if you will. And so they would wander in the wilderness represented by the number four for 40 years until that generation from 20 years old and above till they'd all died off in the wilderness. And then they would skirt the land of Edom, come up the eastern side of the uh, Dead Sea and the eastern side of the Jordan River and uh, be poised to come into the promised land. But 11 days, you know, a little under two weeks, they could have been in and receiving the inheritance that God had for them, but because of unbelief. And that, that's really the key lesson that is brought out in the scriptures, even from this historical passage in Hebrews 3 and 4. The key thing is having faith in God. Don't be filled with unbelief. Make sure you trust him, because when you trust him, then you're gonna receive from him what he has for you and what he has for your life. But when we don't trust him, it tells us it's impossible to please him without faith. And so he's able, you know, he, he is the God of the impossible. He can do anything. And so the lesson for us is to trust in him. And so it's an 11 day journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, and it came to pass in the 40th year. On the first day of the month that Moses spoke to the children of Israel, according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them, Verse 4, after he had killed Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt in Ashtaroth, in Edrei, on this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law, saying. So he's simply telling how they had gone from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, jumping ahead 40 years and then coming up the eastern side and conquering these two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og. This is how God began to give them the victory. And so clearing out the eastern side of the Jordan River, you remember the Jordan Plain, so good for livestock that two and a half of the tribes wanted to stay there, Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. They're good to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan River and inherit that part of it. And so it tells us in verse 5 that... Moses began to explain this law. David Guzik has a comment on the word explain. He says, the word translated explain comes from the ideas to dig deeply or to mine, 
Moses will mine out the riches of God's truth to the people and prepare them to enter in. So he's like the expository preacher to the next generation as they're going over the law and he's digging in deep to, to show this is the real meaning and the sense of what God means by this. And that's really what we want to be doing in, in our Bible studies, isn't it? As we're reading through the Bible, we want to be prayerfully reading through and, and digging in and, and meditating upon the word and let God bring those gold nuggets that are down deep to the surface to, to speak to our hearts, to lead us and to guide us. And so Moses, the expository preacher here in the book of Deuteronomy. And so he began to explain this law saying, verse six, the Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb saying, you have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains, and in the lowland, in the south, and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land, which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them and their descendants after them. So the uh, exhortation to leave Horeb, Mount Sinai, we've been at this mountain long enough, being there for a year, and now it's time to go in and possess what God had promised to them, all the way back to Abraham. The promise in Genesis chapter 12 that Abraham would become a great nation, that his descendants would inherit this very land, and that through him all the nations on the earth would be blessed, referring to the coming of the Messiah through Abraham's descendants. And that promise, that threefold promise, if you will, reiterated to his son Isaac and to his son Jacob. And so hundreds of years have passed, and it's time to go in and receive all that God has for them. And again, all that God has. What, what does God have for his people? You know, when we talk about the promised land, looking at, at typology and pictures of what it looks like in the Christian life, it, it speaks of the abundant life in Christ. It speaks of the kind of life that we can have as we, as we trust Jesus as our Savior, a- originally in salvation, but then ongoing as we live our lives trusting Him. When we come to the difficult times, how am I going to get through this? Which way do I fall? Do I fall to the Lord on my knees, or do I fall away from the Lord? God, why would you do this and, and turn away from Him? As we trust Him, He works even through those trials, doesn't He? He works in the difficult times and molds that character within us to be more Christ-like. And that's really the abundant life. The abundant life isn't all about everything's going great. Everything's beautiful. It's happy days for us. The abundant life speaks about that life we have close to Jesus through the great times and through the difficult times as well. It's that close personal relationship that we have with him. And so to receive what God has for us is to believe in him and to trust him throughout our lives. And so he continues on in verse 9. He says, And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints. How many of you remember that they were a complaining people? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. Verse 14, and you answered me and said, the thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. So the Lord raised up elders to help out Moses. Again, you've got a lot of people there. It's too much for one man. 
And so he raised up those who would be over a group of a thousand, a group of a hundred, a group of fifty, a group of ten, and they would judge, and they were commanded to judge righteously. And if, if the issue was too difficult, then they would bring those things, the big things, to Moses, and and Moses would judge according to God's word. You know, the command to judge righteously, to judge right, there has to be a set standard for what is right and what is wrong, doesn't there? Because if they go and they just, just judge on, well, I think it should be this, that becomes very subjective in their judgment. The way they can be objective in their judgment is to go to a source that tells them what is right and what is wrong, and that is the law that God had given them. And that's what God has given to us as well. How do we know what is right and what is wrong? How can we judge righteously? We can't go by our own opinion because we'll be swayed by the culture that we live in. We have to come back to the word of God where he has set down the standards of what is right and what is wrong. Jesus said in John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Don't judge according to what it looks like to you, we could say, but judge with a righteous judgment because the judgment is God's. He is the one, well, let's ask the question, is he the one that created all of this, including ourselves? If he is the creator, then he is the one that sets the rules and he has set the standards down here in his word. And so the judgment is God's. And so we go to his word and we follow after the laws that he has given. When we do that, Life is just a whole lot better, isn't it? When we get away from that, that's when we end up with a society and a culture like we have today, where every man is doing what seems right in his own eyes, kind of like Israel will do in the book of Judges. So judge righteously, he told the elders as they came out and as they would be ready to go into this land that God had promised them. Then in verse 19, so he continues on, we departed from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites, as the Lord our God had commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go up and of the cities into which we shall come. Now, what did Moses originally say? God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. What did the people say? let's send some spies into the land. You see, as we compare Deuteronomy back with the book of Numbers, we see that it was the people that wanted to send spies into the land. Let's go in and see what it's like and you know, see which cities we should go into first and, and everything like that. And even Moses right here in verse 23, he said, the plan pleased me well. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe. Now I'm going to suggest that possibly had they just gone in in faith going, it doesn't matter who's in the land, it doesn't matter how strong they are. God said, this is the land that we're going to possess, that they would have went in there and God would have given them the victory. But when they got in and they saw with the eye of flesh instead of the eye of faith, they got scared. It says in verse 24, and they departed and went up, that is the spies, into the mountains and came to the valley of Eshcol and spied it out. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us and they brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. You remember that when they uh, came back from the land? It says that they brought one cluster, one cluster of grapes on a pole that was, that was carried between two of them. And that became the symbol and, and still is to this day for the seal of Israel's ministry of tourism, that Israel is such a fruitful land. Now, it doesn't tell us who the two spies were that were carrying that cluster of grapes, but the modern day children of Israel in Israel who, who use this sign for the sign of the ministry of tourism tell us that it's Joshua and Caleb. And of course, we can figure that one out too, can't we? Joshua and Caleb, the two that had faith that God could give them that land. But the other 10, this is the unfortunate thing, they bring back the negative report. So at the end of verse 25, they say, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. Verse 26, 
Nevertheless, there's that word, nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he's brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Now, it's interesting, you know, as Moses is recounting this, they came back and admitted, yes, it's a good land. He uses the word nevertheless in verse 26, you would not go up. It's the same word that they used back in the book of Numbers when they came back from spying out the land. It says in Numbers 13, 27, they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The descendants of the giants are there. So yeah, it's got good fruit, but nevertheless, there's no possible way we can go in there. And so it was a lack of faith, isn't it? A lack of trust in God, a lack of, of knowledge in who really God is. And, and we see the same thing here. Did you notice that in verse 27? It says, you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us. Do you think the Lord hated them? Well, the Lord got angry with them at times, right? But the Lord didn't hate them. They were, they were wrong on their understanding of the very character of God. Wrong on the understanding of who God is and how he feels toward them. You know, in the book of Deuteronomy, the word love is used 25 times. And, and we'll read of God's love for his people and we'll read the exhortation to love God with all of your heart, the idea of a relationship. And so the very character of God is that he loves his people. In fact, if you want to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 7, and I think this is one of the passages we're going to be going to on our survey through the book of Deuteronomy. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. Verse 8, but because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you with the house and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So it wasn't because they were this great, large people. In fact, he said you were the least of the peoples. But it's simply put because God loves you. That's why he's given you this land. And because he's fulfilling the promise that he gave to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so knowing the very character of God is important. And that's, that's really why we want to be reading our Bibles. Because it's the Bible that tells us about God. Who he is, what he's like, and what he thinks of us. And I'll tell you what, from the beginning to the end, even though we see judgment because he's a just God, we see that God loves God loves his people. He loves his creation. In fact, God has shown his love to all of humanity. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How can I know that God loves me? Well, God sent his son. God sent his son to die for you so that you can live. That's God demonstrating how much he loves us. So if you ever think that God hates you, and doesn't want you or doesn't want you to go to heaven, then you're wrong. The truth is he loves you. He brought his son into the world so that you can go to heaven. And yes, I'm sure there's times where we make mistakes, where we sin, let's call it what it is, that it disappoints God, but he's not through with us. He loves us just like a parent loves their child. You know, when your child disobeys, you don't, hopefully you don't, you know, disown him. You're not through with them. You want the best for your children. And so you're looking for that relationship to be restored. That's what God's looking for. When we sin, he's looking for us to repent, for us to come back and, and restore that relationship. And so he can, again, turn us into the people he wants us to be. But I think more importantly, just have that fellowship with us, that relationship with us, because he loves us so much. The Bible tells us of the character of God. That's why we want to be reading our Bible. So the people here who felt that God hated them. They continue on in verse 28. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. More, moreover, we've seen the sons of the, the Anakim there, again, the giants. 
Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. Verse 30, the Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. Remember that God fought for you, he's saying. When you came out of Egypt, he fought for you and gave you victory over the Egyptians. And that's one thing for us to remember. Don't forget the past victories that, that God has wrought in your life. Don't forget what he's done in the past. The same God who rescued you in the past can rescue you right now and will rescue you in the future. And I love the verse where he says how God carried you as a, as a man carries his son. Exodus 19.4, God said, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I just love that picture, you know, like an eagle carrying her, her young coming. That's how I brought you to myself, bringing you out of Egypt and bringing you to myself. This verse really spoke to my heart. It's a cross-reference to this about the Lord carrying us as a man carries his son. Isaiah 46, 4, even to your old age, I am he, and even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. I don't know about some of you older ones, but the older I get, you know, you tend to think, well, you know, you're, you, you should know better by now and, you know, all of these things. But to read this verse, I mean, it really spoke to my heart. It doesn't matter how old you are. God is there to carry you through the darkest valley. And in fact, the older we get, the more, you know, ultimately we're going to need that carrying, aren't we, to see us through all the way to the end. What a precious thing, you know, from, from the womb all the way to the grave. He is able to carry his people. So yet for all, Moses says, for all that he did, you did not believe, and herein lies the problem, their unbelief. Verse 34, and the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him and his children, I'm giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry with me for your sake, saying, even you shall not go in there. Verse 38, Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And again, that's what they did. Only 11 day journey from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, but in the 40th year after that whole generation has passed from the scene because of unbelief, because they did not put their trust in the Lord. Again, that's what the book of Hebrews uh, brings out of this whole historical passage in Hebrews chapter three. Verses 7 and 9, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. So just like they did not trust in the Lord, today, if you hear his voice, don't be like them. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day to make a decision to trust in the Lord. Today is the day to trust him for salvation. Today is the day to trust him for the problems that you have in your life. In verses 18 and 19 of Hebrews 3, it says, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Only two could, Joshua and Caleb. Those were the two spies who came back saying, We can take this land. The Lord has given it to us, and the people, they are our bread. And so Joshua and Caleb would be the only two of that older generation that would be able to go in. Not even Moses could go, as it says in verse 37, as he said, the Lord was also angry with me for your sakes, saying, even you shall not go in there. Now, Moses couldn't go in, but it wasn't because of the unbelief 
with the spy issue. I mean, Moses knew that God could give them the land, but it was actually another lack of faith. You remember, it was when Moses hit that rock, when the children of Israel needed the water. Moses went up and God had said, speak to the rock, but Moses went up and hit it. And this is God's response to Moses in Numbers 20, verse 12. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not, check it out, because you did not believe me, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land, which I have given them, because you did not believe me. The NIV translates that because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy. God saw Moses' actions as a lack of respect and awe for his holiness. And because of that, he couldn't go in. He couldn't take them into the promised land. And how many of you know Moses wanted to go? I mean, he wanted to get into that land that God had promised them. Turn over to chapter 3, if you will. Chapter 3, verse 23 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 3.23, <laughs> Moses says, Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O oh Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon, but the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the, the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan, but command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. Moses wanted to go, but it wasn't going to happen. Joshua, his assistant, Joshua, one of the two faithful, would take him in. Joshua, who, whose name, remember, means Jehovah is our Savior, which is the same meaning of the name Jesus, which means Jehovah is our salvation. It's neat when you look at the typology because Moses, who represents the law, could not bring them into the promised land, the abundant life. But Joshua, Jesus, if you will, can do that. So tying the typology in, it's pretty cool. John 1.17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. God has given us his word. Absolutely, he wants us to obey it, but recognize being a Christian is about having a relationship with God through Jesus. We obey him because we love him, not because we're commanded to, but because we love him, because we're in a relationship with him. That needs to be the basis of our obedience to him. Now, again, I just want to close this with the words out of the Bible Knowledge Commentary, which gives us, I think, an, an overarching summary of the purpose of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses was preaching the law to Israel to impress God's word on their hearts. His goal was to get the people to renew the covenant made at Sinai, to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. Only by unreservedly committing themselves to the Lord could the people hope to enter the promised land, conquer its inhabitants, and then live in prosperity and peace. And you know, they will. They'll make it into the land, and they will conquer many of the peoples in there, and they will have a good start to all of that. But we see as time goes on, that they turn away from following after the Lord. And because of that, because of their lack of faith, because of their unbelief and unfaithfulness, the enemies of God will come in and begin oppressing the people, ultimately taking them all into captivity. Hebrews 11:6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let's be that people, amen? Amen. Why don't we go ahead and stand for a closing word of prayer. And I'd like to invite any who would like prayer to come up at the close of the service. Hey, today if you hear his voice, make the decision to trust Jesus as your Savior, to come and to know him. The older you get, statistically, the least likely it is that you're going to trust the Lord as your Savior. That's just statistics. 
I mean, God is beyond statistics, but I just encourage you today, if you hear his voice, we were so blessed this week to see some of these young elementary age kids give their hearts to Jesus, you know? I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's a great start in life, isn't it? To begin following him at such an early age, but it's never too late, okay? So if you wanna trust Christ as your savior, please come forward at the close of this song and pray with, pray with those that are here. Father, thank you for the time we could spend in your word. Thank you for your love for us, Lord, that we see from Genesis to Revelation. Thank you for demonstrating that love at Calvary where Jesus came and laid his life down so that we can live. And Father, we just offer our lives afresh to you today. Thank you that we can gather here and worship you together. Thank you that we can spend some time in your word and, and just be encouraged to continue to live out these days for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys.